next guest is, again, an international one. Um, Tim will present a tool um, that he developed for, well, tracking third-party trackers. Uh, Tim uh, is a human rights activist and privacy activist from the US, uh, and he's a doctoral candidate at the Anberg School for Communications at the University of Pennsylvania. And right now he's in Berlin as a fellow, a research fellow at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And once we switch the devices. You can start. That looks good. All right, maybe uh, while you're starting the presentation, you can tell us how the tool, I always want to say it's called XKeyScore, but it's not XKeyScore, that's something different. How's the tool called that you uh, developed? Uh, WebEx. WebEx. Yeah. Looks good, all right, okay. Uh, well, let's give a very warm welcome to Tim. Now? All right. Cool. All right, uh, my name's Tim Liebert. I don't know why this thing's in the middle of the screen. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania, a uh, fellow at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute. Uh, in a former life, I was a web developer. Uh, right now, my primary research area is uh, online privacy in the context of web tracking. Um, so the motivation for this, the work I'm gonna present tonight, is kind of building on the premise that Advertising companies spy on the entire web and allow governments to piggyback on this. This isn't news to anybody here. Um, the reason I think this is a problem is because it introduces information asymmetries between companies, governments, and users. And what I mean about asymmetries is sometimes described as privacy, meaning somebody knows more about you than you know about them, including what you do and what motivations are. Uh, so the goal of my work is to document the exact scope and size of the company's tracking networks. I mean, this very empirically fixed way. Uh, and I want to do this to allow users to know what companies are doing and also to hold the companies accountable. Because um, most of the companies go to extreme lengths to obfuscate what they do because they don't want people asking questions because the questions don't have good answers. Uh, so about this talk, uh, part one, I'm going to talk about the techniques of the Web X-ray platform. Uh, Real quickly, I'm going to talk about the basics of kind of like third-party HTTP requests, which is the vector I'm going to look at. I'm going to talk about how kind of the process of designing the software came about and how it works. Uh, and the second part, I'm going to run through a couple different studies I've done, one on uh, health information online and the other one on China. So, um, Basically what we're talking about is third-party HTTP requests. So to help kind of understand what those are, you need to start with kind of like what is a web page. So unlike say like a PDF or something where it's an actual physical file that you kind of transfer over, a web page is more of a recipe. And that recipe has a lot of ingredients that, that come from, you know, in the same way that you might grab ingredients around your kitchen, a web page grabs ingredients from around the web. Um, and the way these ingredients get to your computer is you ask for them using a hypertext transfer protocol. So a page uh, has a bunch of little pieces, the ingredients. Um, some of the ingredients are going to come from the same place as the web page. So those are called first parties. So if you come to my website, I give you the code, and the code says download a picture from me. It's a one-party transaction. 
Um, the other thing that can happen is my page could also have code embedded from another site, and that code could be something you don't see. Um, and this is a vector for surveillance because if you put your code on enough pages, you can track people across the web. So this is a little bit better explained with pictures, or I hope it will be. Um, so usually what happens is your first step in kind of getting a web page to your computer is you tell your browser to go do something. You tell your browser, hey, go ask this server for an HTML page, and that comes back to your computer. At that point, you're not clicking things anymore. The HTML is now requesting more things uh, off the web. Uh, and again, you're not doing anything anymore. That's pretty important. So the HTML can also request images and things without you knowing about it and without you being alerted that there's a new party introduced. So you're doing your thing, you're on your computer, and all of a sudden these new parties are coming in. And there's not like a, a pop-up that's like, hey, we're talking to Google Analytics or something like this. It happens in the background. Uh, and it's not a bad thing. It's supposed to happen that way. This make what makes the web really awesome is it does all this different stuff and it gets your computer and you don't really have to do that much. Um, but the question is, when these requests happen, uh, we're disclosing data. So like, what is that data that happens at the most basic level? Um, so really basic, at the lowest level, what you're transferring is your IP address because that's how the data gets back to you, right? Um, say the type of computer or browser you're using, so that's gonna be, you know, Mac with Safari or Android with Chrome. Um, and this is how like if you're uh, visiting a, a website on your phone, you'll get like the mobile version. And the reason you get the mobile version is because your browser is saying, hey, I'm a mobile web browser and it returns that page. Uh, the other thing that gets disclosed when you have one of these third party elements is the address of the page you're visiting. Uh, and as you can see in bullet point two, the address can contain sensitive material. So just by sending that address refer, someone can see what you're looking at. Um, and just with this type of traffic log, just the HTTP logs, there's research that shows if you have enough of this, you can identify users about 80% accuracy, which is the same as cookies, uh, and you just need logs. And also because it's on server side, the users can't see or do much about it. Um, so this data gives a real window into you know, your interests, your habits, your political leanings, your sexual leanings, all types of things. Um, and I'm focusing on this lower level stuff, but this is almost always augmented with kind of even nastier JavaScript and fingerprinting and exotic types of things hackers love. Uh, so what's you know impact of this thing? So you're loading pages, you're getting these connections to these other parties. They can keep records of this basically forever. Um, and these records reveal what you're looking at. And if the same company, let's say a giant multinational internet company, has codes on many sites, they can kind of follow you around the web. They can make a picture of who you are, and then they can start to target you in different ways. Uh, so what I wanted to do, given this, is I wanted to really document this at the same scale the companies are tracking you at. So the companies who are tracking you have billions of dollars and tons of code and lots of reasons to trick people, I think, to put code on their site. So I'm not a big multinational, but I thought maybe I can, you know, hack my way a little bit closer to the truth. So uh, my strategy for doing this uh, is kind of fourfold. Um, one, I wanted to load a bunch of web pages, like a million or more, quickly. I wanted to find all the requests to the third party domains. I want to store those. Uh, and then I want to figure out of these domains that are contacted, who are the companies that own the domains. Uh, and the last thing is I wanted this to run cheaply on like a virtual machine in the cloud, uh, I wanted it to be able something you can run for like a couple dollars or euros. Uh, so the existing solutions in 2013 when I started working on this, um, they didn't work for me. Uh, first, most of them relied on um, GUIs or you know XBBB, and that takes a lot of RAM. Um, so if you don't have a lot of money, it doesn't work that well. Um, don't know what's going on. Uh, it doesn't, some of the ones out there use SQLite as a backend, which doesn't scale well. If you've ever tried to put like 50 gigs into a SQLite file, um, people start crying. Uh, the other stuff out there didn't produce per company reports, so a lot of things were developed to find like, oh, here's a fingerprinter or something, and I was less concerned with that than who's doing it. Um, another reason it doesn't work is a lot of them are Western focused, so if you have like Ghostry or Adblock Plus, things like that, they're almost exclusively focused on the Western web and Western companies, 
Um, whereas you have China as a giant country that has a whole ecosystem of trackers of their own that I haven't seen picked up um, at least last time I checked the ghost stream stuff. Uh, here's a quick primer for the hackers in the audience about how not to do this quickly. Uh, I thought I could just do wget the pages and hold on. <laughs> We're gonna take a time out. Oh no. <laughs> oh that. <laughs> That's what WGit doesn't work. And repetitive stress injury is a real killer. So this this is important. All right. <laughs> I think we're back. Ah. All right. How not to do it? Uh, don't have your time out of things start in the middle of your uh, talk. That's how not to do it. Uh, so I thought I could just w get all the pages and then use regex to pull out the domains. Uh, in theory, that could scale really well and be really fast as you don't have to download the actual page content. You can just look at the source. Uh, but the problem with that is JavaScript and iframes will actually load in a lot more stuff and, and get cookies. Um, I gave up on this after I killed several kittens using horrible regex. Uh, so the problem was I still needed a browser, but I don't want a GUI, so I'm kind of stuck. Uh, and then I found a solution, which is called PhantomJS, uh, which is totally awesome. So PhantomJS is a headless browser. Uh, what this means is the web browser exists totally on the command line. You don't need a window. You don't need graphics or anything, although it can do screenshots if you want. Very low resource utilization, and it's completely scriptable with a like, pretty nice JavaScript API. Uh, the, uh, see, I don't even know, man. Uh, let's keep going. The uh, PhantomJS is actually really amazing for network monitoring because it has two API calls that are super useful. One is on resource requested, and the second one is on resource received. So as the page is loaded, you're firing off these network requests, and Phantom just has this sweet API call that just dumps them all out for you, which is cool. It also has like kind of a cookie jar you can manipulate and pull cookies out of. Um, that said, there's some pain points with uh, Phantom JS trying to do multiple URI redirects sucks. Uh, the other thing is because we're doing trackers, trackers can sometimes be really slow to get to your computer, which is I think everybody's like been waiting for a web page to download. Like what the hell? Turns out it's a Facebook like button. Um, but in my case, I wanted to make sure all that crap got to the computer, so I kind of had to tweak Phantom JS to wait much longer. Um, there's also some issues with uh, picking the right user agent string, uh, managing Chinese character encodings, stuff like that. So if you go down that road, it's not super painless, but it's still pretty amazing. Um, so I figured out uh, PhantomJS could work, but then I needed to automate it so I could do a bunch of sites. Uh, so PhantomJS will spit the data out to the command line, um, but you, know, you need to collect this, you need to store it, you need to make it actionable and understandable. So I wrote a Python program, uh, Web X-Ray, and basically what it does, you give it a list of web pages, it feeds them to the Phantom JS, it grabs the data back, and it processes it. Um, for the Python hackers in the room, uh, I use subprocess and multiprocessing, which are both really, really useful for this. Um, and the nice thing about that in terms of scaling with multiprocessing and Phantom JS, basically if you double the RAM, you double the instances of Phantom JS you can run. Um, so we'll talk more about how that's cost effective later. Uh, and the last thing is I use MySQL as a database backend because it does not complain when you're throwing a million records at it. So uh, back to the task. Uh, we want to load the page, dump out all the network events, uh, and at that point we're going to get a bunch of URLs. And the problem here is we have to pull out the domains. And as you can see in this one, sub.example.ac.uk, uh, that's kind of a 
tough one to parse because you can't just take the last two tokens going back, otherwise you would think it was ac.uk, um, and you don't want sub example.ac.uk because if you had, say, images.example.ac.uk, I don't count that as a third party, but if you just go on that, that would happen. So it's kind of a nightmarish uh, thing to figure out, but the Mozilla public service was super helpful. Um, third thing, basic logic, if the page domain and the requested domain don't match, if it's a third party request, we store it, we analyze it. So, so far I've just talked about technical stuff. Um, I'm really more interested in the social relationship. Uh, so the most important thing that the software really does is to detect the companies. Um, so first, the first couple of runs I was doing this, I would start picking out maybe the top 100 requested domains. So these are ones that aren't happening by accident. It's not someone's private CDN or something. This is what I'm seeing like across 100,000 sites. Uh, so I'd take those domains and then figure out who owns them, which is not always easy uh, for sometimes some of these ad companies go to lengths to obfuscate their um, domain ownership, which sometimes by feeling cheeky, I'll ask them on Twitter if they own it and they never reply. Um, so basically that just kind of starts with who is and then I'll even go digging into crunch base and stuff and uh, I'll talk a little bit later, a Chinese colleague works with me and he did a really good job on digging into the Chinese web and trying to figure out who these Chinese companies are also. Um, so again, this is kind of like the whole reason this works is really this final step to kind of connect the companies to the technical data. Uh, final note on just the scaling thing. Um, so on a 64 gigs of RAM, if you do a 90 second uh, delay on the page, which is like a lot of time for all the elements to get there, you can do about 30,000 pages an hour. So uh, based on one uh, provider I like, that's about a euro for 30,000 pages, or about 30 euro to scan the Alexa one million in one and a quarter days. Uh, the cost savings are linear. If you want to be more patient in five days, you can do a million sites for seven and a half euro, which I think is like pretty affordable. Um, so that was kind of like a big part of the reason I wanted to do this and code it this way. It's because I want it to be cheap. Um, again, because the companies who are tracking you have a billion dollars to track you, and I have seven and a half euro to track them. Uh, so what does the data tell us? Uh, Actually, I'm only going to talk about two research projects. Like, so I'm going to talk about health websites and Chinese websites. You can ask me later about the NSA. Um, so this is a quote I really like. I think this is the world's oldest privacy policy, as far as I can tell, which is whatever I see or hear in the lives of my patients, I will keep secret as considering all such things to be private, and that's the Hippocratic Oath. Um, I don't know if someone has done a history of privacy policies, but I do think fifth century is definitely in the running. Um, so health, online. So health is one of the kind of most universally recognized privacy contexts. It doesn't matter, I don't think, what culture or what country you go to. There's a generally accepted idea that what you talk about with your doctor should remain <laughs> in the room. Um, but that's kind of changed. Now people are going to the web to find out about medical conditions, find out what's wrong with them, what's wrong with their families, uh, loved ones. And so personal information that used to be safe in a doctor's office, and doctors are professionals you can generally trust, all of a sudden that's moved to the web. And as we know, the web is full of people trying to spy on you. So I wanted to kind of get into this and try to figure out, all right, if you're actually looking for information on a disease, who's going to know about it? Uh, so what I did is I took the top 50 search results for 2,000 common disease names um, and this study was localized to U.S. English results. Uh, when I got rid of duplicates, I had about 80,000 pages. I threw those into uh, Web X-Ray uh, to give me a report of who the companies are and so I can see what they do with the data. The other thing I did is I took a sample of the pages and I looked at the URI um, to see if the condition or treatment or symptom was in the actual address. And it turned out 70, or we'll get to the next one. So I looked at that, so what I would do is, you can see an example, WebMD, who hates me, uh, has a site, webmd.com slash HIV AIDS. So the findings, uh, about nine in 10 pages leak data to third parties. 70% of the, the uh, URIs include the disease. It's right there, they don't have to do anything extra, it's in the log. 
uh, only 3% of pages forced SSL. So what I did is I load all the pages uh, over plain HTTP, and then I record it if they were redirected. So 3% redirected, which is shitty. Uh, Google was on 78% of pages. Uh, that was double the next uh, company. So I don't have the graph here, but it's like a power law distribution. It's just Google, and then like goes down. Um, and I reran this uh, UK, France, Deutschland. I got pretty much the same uh, results across the board. So if you're in Germany, you're just as much at risk. And so then the next thing I did is I want to see like what are the policies around this data? How is this data circulating around? And, and like how is this protected? It turns out it's not protected. Um, the industry likes to say they don't need laws because they regulate themselves. Uh, these regulations are super vague. There's, they're not auditable. You can't check if they comply or if they have a process to comply. Um, and they, they're also like allow a pretty wide range of stuff. So uh, NAI is one of the major industry groups. Their guidelines say it's okay to target people for headaches, but not cancer. And kind of in between that is life. Um, so uh, in the US, this is legal. Uh, if you're com somewhat familiar with U.S. laws, we have HIPAA as a health privacy law. Uh, doesn't cover things happening on the web. Um, globally, the only action I, I know of, and I would like to know if there's others, is Canada pursued like a pretty weak enforcement action against Google because they were targeting someone ads for like sleep apnea. And Google acknowledged that some of the advertisers using its ad service did not comply with the corporation's policy which I think is a weird way to go about it because if you build a giant tracking mechanism and you're selling people screen real estate to anybody who wants to target them on anything, I don't know why it's the uh, problem of the client who put in the search terms for targeting people and not the person who's collecting the data, but that's how they see it. So moving on to the other side of the world. Uh, so another quote, this is, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Web Terran is dedicated to facilitating the development of digital governance in China and to exploring effective means to monitor influential and positional views and discussions concerning social events. Uh, and this is from a Chinese government contractor's web page who I'll talk about in a minute. So the Chinese web. Um, so me and my uh, co-author, Bo Mai, we started with kind of this question was, can we kind of detect the Chinese government either directly or through proxies, uh, using this type of technology, web tracking technology, to uh, monitor Chinese netizens. And, and part of the reason we got to that is because the Snowden revelation showed that a couple very specific Google cookies were being used by the NSA. So we know, at least in the US and in the West, that the NSA hasn't developed their own web tracking technology. They just use other people's stuff off the backbone. So we're like, all right, well, maybe what's going on in China. Um, so three possibilities. One is that we, we could find a way that was directly attributable to the government, which kind of wouldn't be as surprising as you would think. They're not really that shy about the fact that they've managed the internet there. People know. Um, the government's not afraid to just tell people that's what's up. Uh, second thing, we could do it with contractors, like the quote before showed. Um, and the last one is there could be behind the scenes coercion or interception. That's not something we're gonna see without Chinese Edward Snowden, but we can kind of narrow down possibilities and figure out if that's what's likely happening. Um, so what we did is we looked at the top uh, 500 Alexa Chinese websites. Kind of hard to find a decent list of Chinese websites. That's what we went with. I did that again with uh, a friend of mine, Bo Mai. So we collected this data on September 2015. Of the 500, we got 467 pages. The ones we didn't were like banks and stuff. We seemed resistant to scraping. Uh, and again, we're sitting about nine out of 10 pages uh, leaking data. So uh, if it's government attributable surveillance, what we would expect to see is a request going to a government registered or controlled domain that would connect two or more sites in the population. Um, so what we did is we looked at all the domains that were requested and we tried to figure out which ones are related to the government. And this, this wouldn't be surprising. So here's an example of a page. This is like art stuff. I can't read Chinese. Um, but under the hood, uh, should notice this does not anywhere look like a government website. It doesn't say like Chinese government, but you look under the hood, there's actually a request in here for a script at uh, ebs.gov.cn. Um, 
So this goes to ebs.gov.cn. Uh, and what they are is it's the Shenzhen Market Supervision Bureau. And basically, they're just kind of like trying to promote and regulate e-commerce. It's not state security or something. Um, and the other ones we found, excuse me, the other ones we found were like CCTV PIC, which is China Central Television Picture.com. Um, so that's like image hosting and stuff. So you would see images maybe embedded from other websites. And that is linked to the government. Uh, again, not really like a surveillance function. It's just, you know, this is how you host websites. Um, and in the population, we only found out on 4% of sites. So in terms of like, can we see the government forcing companies to embed their content? Not really. Second thing you could do, the government could be contracting out. So what would happen is a request would go to companies who contract with the government. So what we did is we compared the web x-ray findings with a government procurement database. Um, and this is something that Bo looked into, and it turns out there's a competitive bidding, competitive bidding for different IT contracts in China. So we said, okay, like let's figure out the companies who get this data and see if they're in that database. Um, and this kind, I think this kind of detective work is cool because it it shows like I couldn't do this on my own, and Bo couldn't do that on his own. So I think you really get cool stuff when you combine the coding aspect and kind of like the normal, almost journalistic investigation. Um, so here's another one. This is a state news agency, uh, and under the hood here we have a link to Web Terran, who we started with a quote from. So when we looked at the population, we found two companies, Nonsec and Web Terran. Um, after we found them, uh, Bo actually did an in-depth qualitative case study. So he kind of learned everything he could about these companies. Um, and it turns out Nonsec is kind of like just like your, you know, normal cyber security firm. Like if, if someone's going to DDoS you or something, they'll step in and make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, Web Terran is pretty interesting because the, the text on their website is slightly tweaked text from um, like Chinese government decrees on how the internet should be managed. So they're very closely aligned with the government and they specialize in public opinion monitoring and looking for you know, like anti-social opinions and trying to find trouble you know, before it begins. Um, and the other thing that's kind of interesting about that as an aside is there's, I'm gonna go academic for a minute. Um, there's this thing that sounds kind of like the dictator's dilemma, which the dictator's dilemma is, we're going to suppress speech, but we still want to know what people are thinking. So if we suppress all the speech, we don't know what people are thinking, then we make bad decisions and people come with pitchforks. So Web Terran is kind of in this space where what people have called China's a responsive authoritarianism. So they're in charge, but they'll listen to, you know, the chatter on Weibo and stuff to figure out the smallest amount of reforms they need to make to make sure people don't riot, uh, which has worked out fairly well for them. So, uh, so far, we found 92% uh, of the pages had tracking, 4% of that attributed to the government, 3% to two government contractors. So what's the rest? Uh, commercial. So nearly all the tracking is commercial. Uh, like with the health stuff, it's highly consolidated among a few companies. There's a very long tail of, you know, kind of mom and pop niche players. Uh, and the same as in the West, this drive is to increase ad revenue with targeted advertising. Stuff is happening on the uh, European web, is happening on the Chinese web. Uh, so the top 10 trackers, uh, as you'd imagine, most of them are Chinese because China has a pretty robust domestic internet industry. So I'm sure you can see there. But the third one is Google, the American company. Um, and the 10th one is Amazon. Uh, Amazon is mainly Amazon web services. Google will talk more about in a minute. But it's pretty interesting because I really think China is one of the few countries that I've seen that is really de kind of developing like a really huge domestic ecosystem of, of all new tracking technology. So there's, I think there's probably more developments here I haven't even scratched the surface of. So um, we can't conclusively say the government is leveraging this commercial beha surveillance behind the scenes, uh, but there's pretty much two options. One, they're just not interested in the data. Or two, they have some sort of secret data exfiltration or sharing. Uh, and again, everything we know from Snowden suggests that there's really no reason the Chinese wouldn't want to do this. But, uh, you know, we'll save that for another day and hopefully a Chinese Snowden will tell us more. Uh, one more thing about China. 
Um, what you see pretty frequently, at least in the Western press, is this idea that you have the, the Western internet companies are fighting for freedom, and those damn Chinese won't let their people be free. Uh, so if you're uh, inside China and you try to you know, ping Gmail, most Google services are going to be blocked. Here's the leaders of China and Google, respectively. They're not friends. Uh, I would like to emphasize most requests are blocked. I'd also like to emphasize the anywhere aspect of Google Analytics. It turns out the Chinese government selectively permits Google Analytics. So they block most Google stuff. Things that are going to give you access to information the government doesn't like, they're going to block. But Google knows very well, because they have the logs, that they're getting information on 25% of the top websites, and this is something the government does not block. The government chooses specifically to allow this. Uh, a really good example, too, is when um, Google made the new uh, Alphabet reorganization. Alphabet was blocked, the new like alphabet.com or whatever they did. It was blocked within like an hour. They've been letting Google Analytics through for years. I've been watching this, it's crazy. Um, so, uh, again, uh, Web X ray is also able to detect blocked requests. So, if there's a request event but there's not a receive event, I can see, okay, well, it's not coming through. So, we put the computer in mainland China and we ran it. It does not get blocked. This tracking does not get blocked. It's let through. This is empirical results I stand by. Uh, even worse, 86% of these requests are not encrypted. So Google Analytics can be encrypted. Uh, they've not taken any steps to force uh, encryption, probably because there's so much like, legacy code out there. Um, but if you're Chinese, uh, the Chinese government is allowing Google Analytics to run on a quarter of the sites, and that's not encrypted. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, they, they really make it trivial to intercept their traffic. Uh, Clearly, the government benefits something from Google Analytics, or they wouldn't let it work. Uh, and, then, and this is kind of mutually beneficial, because if Google uh, wants to come back to the Chinese market, which they do, they already have a huge database of what websites people visit. Um, so in reality, I think Google and China are surveillance BFFs. Uh, this is, I think, a better picture of what's really going on between them. Uh, there's also a piece I wrote with my friend Maria Rafnikova in The Guardian where we kind of like talk about this and the uh, implications of that a little more. So if you want like a you know, 10 minute read that gets into it, it's there. Um, I was going to talk about other projects, but I don't have time. I think I went on too long anyways. A uh, couple other things I've been doing with the software is uh, I looked at the track the presence of the um, NSA cookies or the Google slash NSA cookies. There's a partnership there as well. Uh, and uh, those are quite prevalent. Uh, another thing I did, I've been looking at the Black Lives uh, Matter movement and trying to figure out the degree to which those websites, and that's uh, protests against police violence in the US. Um, another thing I've been doing is looking at tracking on news websites, which news websites are like way higher amounts of tracking than anything else. So if you want to start from a premise that, say, in a democratic environment, access to information is good for the body politic, you could also say access to information that's surveilled at, I think, about five times, or so I forget the exact number, uh, than a normal website is super bad. Uh, all right. The last thing, I am building a longitudinal data set. Uh, I do the Alexa 100,000 every two weeks. I started in January 2015. I have about 10 or uh, 100 million requests cataloged, and I'm still trying to like work through that data and figure it out. But I'm trying to develop a big uh, picture of that. Uh, you can contact me. Uh, that's my work address, personal website, and I would really love it uh, if people actually tried the software and let me know. You know, your experiences with that. If things go well, if you have bugs, I'd love to fix them. Uh, yeah, so I'm done. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> well, many thanks, Tim, for your interesting talk and the great work you do. Um, I'd expect there to be some questions or remarks from the audience. Yes.
Thanks a lot for all the work you you've done. I wonder um, what can we do as a user to protect us against tracking? Um, I think what can you do? I mean, take this, move it. Oh, okay. Or yeah, I'll set it here. Um, I think usually the hacker answer is, is we're going to come up with like a super crazy VPN Tor node slash script blocker, you know, slash predictive modeler of tracking. I, I don't think that works. Um, I think what you really need is the state to be involved, right? Because the state is ultimately the, the only way, uh, let me rephrase this, technical fixes are temporary. They're band-aids and they come off after you go swimming a week later. They just don't work, right? Um, and we have 20 years of people trying to counteract web tracking with every plugin and everything. A and by the time you put them all on, your computer barely runs. Um, so what you really need is laws. Uh, and what laws means is that if a company does something and we detect a company doing it and it's illegal, someone goes to the company and says, hello, here's a gun. You have to do, this is what the people agreed to. Um, And I, I mean, me personally, that's why I focus on policy and try to focus on the companies because I, I think it has to, it's a social problem. You need a social solution, which is laws. So I think that was maybe a longer answer. But um, just a short assurance: um, I'm a lawyer and I'm uh, working with data uh, protection, data security. And the uh, oldest data protection rule you found is the oldest one I found, and I really tried hard over a couple of years. Question? I oh, was that? I don't know. What's the question? Oh, okay. Oh, what's that question? Oh, okay, because I gotcha. Oh. <laughs> That's what I thought. I was like um, just a short note, it could be interesting to visualize this data in a, um, have you ever thought about it or are you like collaborating with any people? Yeah, my uh, skill set is limited to bar charts, but if you or your friends are good at visualization, I will give you more data than you can visualize. So <laughs> okay, there's Email some people <laughs> here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, over there. Hi, I'm Jetz, and I'm a data scientist and data journalist. Uh, we did something similar, and we also used the uh, WebKit browser as a JavaScript module. Um, yeah, please give us a torrent. Uh, it's actually, it's on uh, timlieber.me. There's a one, there's a 35 million uh, record file, and that's from the, it's the Alexa, it's the Alexa one million sites from uh, 2014, and that's like 35 million records. Um, The health stuff is up there. The China stuff isn't available for download because the paper's been in academic review for about 27 years. Um, so maybe in another 15, I can actually post the data. But if you want it, I'll email it to you. I just can't put it on the web. But we'll post the links afterwards. Um, you said that the state has to get involved to stop such kind of trackings in, in mm -hmm. this uh, What do you think about the, the French government uh, which approached Facebook recently to stop tracking non-users? Is it feasible or in, in some way because they have these Facebook buttons on the, fa on the pages and basically also tracking everyone? So does that mean that Google now has also to stop tracking in France or something like this. And I'm a little bit curious because it's al always so selective. They are saying, okay, Facebook, stop this. But as you told us, there are many f uh, companies uh, out there doing the back? same stuff. Oh, all right, that's gone. Um, yeah, I mean, I think finding the companies is a great idea. You just have to find them more money than they make from doing it. And they make a lot of money from doing it. So I think... Um, It's kind of interesting. I was talking to somebody once who's a who had worked for uh, one of the major American telecom providers in like the 80s and 90s as a regulator, and they were like, "We would always follow the law. We would never do a cost benefit." And she's she was telling me, "Now you see these internet companies, they don't look at the law as you must do this. They look at the law as a cost of business." Um, And I think that's really deeply troubling. I feel like this idea of a democracy where we come up with laws and people follow them. 
Um, so I think fines need to be big. They need to probably greatly exceed the amount of money you are making from doing the practice, which right now they don't. It's a tax. Um, and since the companies don't get taxed otherwise, it's, you know, they're still basically breaking out ahead. Um, the Facebook like button, I see that all over the place. It's super prevalent. Um, especially on like websites for cancer and stuff, there's like a like button and I'm like, wow, all right, that's great. Uh, and yeah, Google's in there, but there's, I mean, I'm kind of picking on Google and Facebook, but there is this like, like I said, there's a long tail of all these companies who are doing this and they aren't making headlines, but in some cases they do even more dubious and kind of shady stuff because nobody's checking on them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people to find. I think it's great, go get the money. Okay, maybe that's a good statement to finish that talk with. Thank you, Timothy, again.